Welcome to St. Anthony of Padua Chapel. We're in West Orange here. We have the traditional Latin Mass here on Sunday and Holy Days, on First Friday, First Saturday. We have quite a schedule of Masses. And of course we have confession every time we have Mass. We, have, uh, we put aside some time, half hour before Mass, for people to receive the Sacrament of Penance. For those of you who are not Catholic there, when we say the Sacrament of Penance, <coughs> It is one of the seven sacraments. For short, we say confession, but confession is only a part of the sacrament. It's, it's kind of a, you might say, a nickname for the sacrament of penance, you see, because in order to receive the sacrament of penance, which is forgiveness of sins through the priest, through the instrumentality of the priest, because God only, God can forgive sins, <clears throat> uh, that what is necessary is to examine our conscience, be sorry for our sins, confess our sins to the priest, make a firm purpose of amendment, and do the penance which the priest gives us. So you notice of those five things, I'm holding up five fingers so it's easy to remember, examine a conscience, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, aha, the third one. So we call it confession. And then, um, firm purpose of amendment and accept the penance which a priest gives us. So we have that and uh, we need confession. Uh, you know, you could, there should be a sign over the confessional. It says doorway to heaven, really. You have sins on your soul. How are you going to stand before God someday at the last judgment if you have mortal sins on your soul? Where are they going to be taken away? Who's going to wash them away? How can the lamb, the blood of the lamb wash them away? How can they be applied to you except through a sacrament instituted by Jesus Christ. Oh, you say, well, no, what I'll do is I'll go up in the mountain, I'll tell God I'm sorry. Oh, really? Did he hear you? Did he, did he accept your penance? Did you have sufficient repentance? How do you know? But see, God instituted the sacrament, and he puts the priest there in, in his place as his agent, as his vicar, <clears throat> so that the priest can make a judgment as to whether you have sufficient repentance, sufficient sorrow, and you have a sufficient firm purpose of amendment, you see. So God is good to institute this sacrament of penance. Uh, and uh, we have that in, in, the, uh, in our chapel. If you go into one of those American church churches, Am Church, liberal Novus Ordo churches, uh, when do they have confessions? Half hour, 15 minutes, 45 minutes, never emphasized. It's practically disappeared, practically, virtually disappeared in the American church, okay? I mean, if that's not a sign that they have fallen into some great errors, then I don't know what is, to practically eliminate one of the seven sacraments. Okay, uh, so we're up there on um, West Orange, up here in West Orange, uh, 1360 Pleasant Valley Way. <clears throat> Come up Route 280, get off at exit 7. That's Pleasant Valley Way. Exit 7 on 280 is Pleasant Valley Way. And then go towards West Orange a mile and a half. Don't go towards Verona. Go the other way. And, uh, and about a mile and a half down the road, it's a quick mile and a half, you'll see our chapel. And uh, you'll see a phone number here, and uh, you can call that any time. We have so many things to talk about. We want to ca call this Catholic commentary. And I think what I'll do a little bit today, we'll talk about devotion to the Blessed Mother. I recently a young boy in our chapel moved to Alabama and uh, <clears throat> the young boy went to live with his father who was in service, a career man in service. So and his father's here and hither, as a matter of fact his father's in somewhere in Southeast Asia. So he's alone with his grandmother and some of the people around there who are what we call Bible Belt Protestant people, nice people, and they said, well, come on into our Bible class. He's a nice boy, 17, 18. He's a friendly kid. And uh, so he, he, he wrote me a whole bunch of things that they told him about the Catholic religion. I couldn't believe that people would say that, you know. In other words, he's a Catholic boy, and uh, they're trying to convert him by telling them that what's wrong with the Catholic religion. And things are not, they're not even wrong. They're, uh, they're erroneous opinions about the Catholic Church. For example, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary wasn't really a virgin. 
that she had other children. Now, why would anybody tell this to this young boy? First of all, it's not true at all. It says in the Old Testament in Isaiah that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. So in the Old Testament, the, the mother of the Messiah was going to be a virgin and remain a virgin. I know it's a miracle. Of course it's a miracle. Uh, it's a miracle because physically um, a woman, if she has a, a child, if she has relations, she's no longer a virgin. And of course, if she gives birth, she's no longer a virgin. And uh, so there's a physical breaking of some veil there. And, uh, but in Mary's case, she was ever a virgin. Of course it's a miraculous. She was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. Why would they say Mary had other children? Well, I mean, what does that bother people? I mean, uh, you know, on, on the cross, Christ was on the cross. And he had his last words and last phrases, seven last phrases that he had. Remember, Father, forgive them. That was one phrase. I thirst. That was another phrase. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Another phrase was, he looked down at Mary and said, Behold thy son. Now, Mary had other children. <laughs> Why would you say that? I mean, St. John was called a beloved disciple. He's the one, St. John, when you see the picture of da Vinci's uh, famous three-dimensional painting of the Last Supper, and one of these apostles is leaning on our Lord's breast, that's St. John. He was the youngest. He was affectionate. He was uh, childlike. And uh, he lived to be the oldest. He died in the year 98, John. The apostle, who was also an evangelist because he wrote one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And that's him, John the Evangelist. <clears throat> and um, so our, our Lord commended John to take care of his mother and his mother to take care of John as his son. So why people say that is beyond me. Uh, how could they possibly tell this young Catholic boy that Mary had other children? Not that it's wrong to have children, but from the very beginning of... Uh, the Catholic faith, the Christian faith, before there was anything, there was no Lutheranism, there was no uh, Presbyterianism or anything like that. <clears throat> um, it was universally held among Christians that Mary was ever virgin. Well, then, how did Mary have the baby? The baby meaning Christ. And St. Alphonsus and the other saints say that Christ was born through Mary's womb as a light passes through a window. It doesn't break the window. See? And Christ was born through Mary's body like that. It's a beautiful uh, way of looking at it. It was definitely miraculous. Well, let's look a little bit at the Blessed Mother here in the scriptures. <clears throat> and um, matter of fact, that's a devotion to Our Lady. I have her statue here in the rosary. A devotion to Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, is, you might say, the quintessential difference between Catholicism and Protestantism. They would say, well, she was a good lady, she was the mother of our Savior. But they don't give, they don't say the Hail Mary, you know. And uh, we respect other people's religion. Uh, we respect people who possess these religions, you know. And, uh, but how could anybody say possibly that Mary had other children or she's just an ordinary woman? Now this is from St. Luke, uh, chapter 1. <clears throat> In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. 
And the angel had come to her and said, Hail, Ave, in Latin, Ave, Maria. Hail, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed art thou among women. And we say the Blessed Virgin Mary. Blessed art thou among women. The angel who was, who was the messenger of God is saying to Mary and to the whole world that blessed art thou among women. And then in the, uh, the it's a beautiful uh, passage. I'm not going to read the whole thing there from St. Luke. But fast forward a few more verses and uh, Mary now, the Blessed Virgin Mary, is... Uh, is carrying Jesus, but her, her cousin, Elizabeth, conceived in her old age. She never thought, she thought she was barren. And what a miracle, what a tremendous joy that uh, Elizabeth and, uh, was, uh, and Zachary were having this baby, who, who turned out to be John the Baptist. So Mary went to visit. She went to the hill country, it says in the scriptures. Went with haste to the hill country and stayed and stayed with Elizabeth for three months to help her out. She was an older woman. She's having a baby. Mary was quite young. Mary was under 20. We're almost positive of that. She was quite young because people did have babies quite young in those days. The lifespan was not that long. <clears throat> Didn't have penicillin and uh, diphtheria shots and things like that. You know, now with our technology, the, the actuarial tables, I think they said the average age, and they based our insurance rates on these, you know, something like 76 or 77. It's incredible, really. Uh, by the year, what, 2010 or something like that? They judged that, uh, that something like 15% of the population will be uh, over 80 or 85, something like that. Anyway, I don't want to get off on that, but um, Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. We call that the visitation. And St. Francis de Sales founded a religious order based on that. He called it the visitation nuns. They didn't visit houses. His nuns of St. Francis de Sales were called the visitation sisters. And they were, uh, they were enclosed. They were a contemplative order. Anyway, Mary uh, entered the house of Zachary and saluted Elizabeth. And Elizabeth cried out, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out with a loud voice, saying, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So Elizabeth, guided by the Holy Spirit, in the scriptures, says, calls Mary blessed. And then Mary recites a prayer we call the Magnificat, which, which says, My soul magnifies the Lord. Magnificat anima mea domini. Domino, magnificat anima mea domino. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And by the way, this is a real good example of what true humility is. Humility is not denying the good things God has given us, but it's affirming them and attributing them to God. Well, I don't want to give you sports metaphors all the time, but <clears throat> if, a, if a person was, say, uh, excelled in uh, running, or basketball, and uh, instead of saying, oh, I'm no good, you know, he's looking for a comp, no, he should say, well, thank God. If, I, if I'm fast, thank God. If I'm coordinated, thank God. If I'm tall, thank God. Where did it come from? It came from God. Oh, yes, I did work at it and I practiced, but the uh, raw material and the ability even to use the raw, raw material came from God. So true humility is not denying good things that you have, but attributing them to God. You see? That's what it is. It's, uh, in a word, humility is being honest. That's right. Honesty. I'm honest about it. Some person is uh, 
has a good voice or is good looking according to the world. And they say, well, thank God. It's, it's a gift from God. See? So Mary was chosen to be the mother of the Savior, the Messiah. And for centuries and centuries, ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, God promised a Savior, a Messiah, who would come and reopen the gates of heaven and make salvation possible. So Mary was chosen as this vast electionis, the vessel of election, to be the mother of the Savior. And so she proclaimed her Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. For behold, henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. So how, how could you be a Christian and not say the Hail Mary? The words of the scriptures, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. How could you say, I'm a Christian, and not say the Hail Mary? And not say it many times over. Sometimes people say, well, you know, Catholics repeat prayers. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with repeating your prayers? Didn't Bishop Sheen say, when someone asked him that years ago, it was a great spokesman for the Catholic Church, Bishop Sheen. And he said, uh, God never gets tired of that. The Blessed Mother never gets tired of it. Hail Mary, full of grace, never gets tired of it. Any more than a mother would get tired of a child saying, Mom, I love you. Mom, I love you, Mom. You think a mother gets tired of that? She never gets tired of that. I love you. You know, and we're a child of Mary, and we say, Mary, I love you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. She never gets tired of it. So there are some, like, I have to say, very unreasonable objections to Mary. It's almost, it's chilling to me. Why would anybody be opposed who calls themselves Christian and reads the Holy Scripture, why would they be opposed to Mary? Somebody must have put some ideas in their mind, you know. <clears throat> I'm looking at a, a booklet called uh, The Question Box. And let's see how they phrase this. They say, uh, these are questions that people who are not Catholic have asked the church over the years. And uh, someone had the enterprising idea of putting all these into a book called The Question Box. And uh, why do Catholics pay so much honor to Mary when she was only an ordinary woman? Does not Catholic devotion to her detract from the worship due to Christ? Answer, the Catholic Church has always paid special honor to the Blessed Virgin because God honored her above all creatures by bestowing upon her the highest, highest dignity he could, he could confer, the divine maternity. <clears throat> Jerry Mattatix, who uh, is a Catholic convert, and uh, he, he, he's, he gets asked that question now and then. Here's the way he answers it. He said, look, we're Christians, right? We're supposed to follow the example of Christ, right? Right? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, yes. And you have to follow his example, right? Right. So didn't Jesus Christ say, honor thy father and thy mother? So didn't he honor his father and mother? So aren't we supposed to follow Christ and honor his father and mother? Aren't we supposed to honor his mother? If we call ourselves Christians and we're imitators of Christ, don't we honor his mother? Don't we keep the fourth commandment? The scriptures tell us that Jesus honored her by dwelling with her under the same roof at Nazareth for 30 years until he began his public ministry. <clears throat> and that he showed his love for her on the cross when he left her to the kindly care of his beloved disciple, St. John. I could never understand how intelligent men hope to extol the Son of God by making little of the Mother of God. We do not win the affections of our fellow men by despising or make little of their mothers. If you go in someone's home, uh, let's say you young men, Let's say 
there's a young lady that you're attracted to and um, you're going to go to her house and pick her up and you're going to go to a movie or something. And you go in the house and uh, the mother's there and you talk to her and you show her respect. Does that take away f from the daughter? It not only does not take away, it increases your respect for the daughter. No man is an island. No person, no person exists by himself or herself. We're part of something. We're part of the human race and we're part of the circle closes when we talk about blood relations. You know. So when you wrote, show respect to your blood, you're showing respect to you. Matter of fact, if this young fella came to call on this young lady <clears throat> and he was disrespectful to the mother or ignored her or belittled her, well, the girl wouldn't like him very much, would she? You'd say, what kind of a guy is this? He doesn't respect my own mother, you know? So how can people belittle the Blessed Virgin Mary? How does that take away from attention to her son, Jesus Christ? It enhances it. It increases it. Now, if you're uh, a person who doesn't know much about the Catholic faith and you go into a Catholic church and you'll see some statues, these are visible reminders of these friends of God, including his, there's usually a prominent statue of Our Lady. Now, we have one here, but it's usually much bigger. <clears throat> and you might see flowers, you might see some candles. Now, on, in the middle, in the place of honor, is the tabernacle where Jesus Christ is present in the Holy Eucharist. We have over here the Blessed Mother, statue of St. Joseph. St. Anthony, we have a statue of St. Anthony. And we show respect for the family of Christ and his friends. And uh, it's about as normal as apple pie <laughs> for a Catholic to do that. It does not only, it, it not only does not take away attention to Christ, but it increases it. How can you call Mary, an ordinary woman, and pretend that you have studied the scriptures. Would God chose an ordinary woman to be the mother of his only son, when countless of other women he could choose from? The prophet Isaiah spoke of her centuries before, and God sent a special ambassador to announce her supereminent dignity, the archangel Gabriel. The angel and Elizabeth called her blessed among women, St. Luke chapter 1, and her own prophecy that henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, St. Luke chapter 1, verse 48. Instead of detracting from the love of Christ, devotion to Mary increases our love for him. The devout client of Mary is ever the strong defender of the divinity of Jesus Christ, her son, and this divine maternity, as the Council of Ephesus clearly recognized in the year 431, has ever been the standard of orthodox belief in the true doctrine of the Incarnation. See, it, it, there was a heresy called Arianism way back in the uh, late three, uh, 300s and early 400s. And as most heresies, even the heresy today of modernism, they attack the divinity of Christ. That's what they do. He's less than God. And uh, they were arguing and debating and and uh, all this speculative stuff. And then the people at the council said, wait a minute, you're talking about all these theological nuances, but if you say, you Arians, they were called A-R-I-N, after a, a priest by the name of Arius, if you say that Christ is not God, then Mary is not the mother of God. Out, you rascals, get out of here. And because the ramifications of demeaning the honor to our Blessed Mother became evident to them. They uh, threw out the heretics and reaffirmed the divinity of Christ at the Council of Ephesus, the year 431. A Catholic, a Catholic Roman, there was no Protestantism then anyway, <coughs> a Catholic um, council, ecumenical council that was held in Ephesus in Asia Minor. The Mary, the mother of God. So love for Mary, the masterpiece of God's creation, by its very nature leads us to the love of Christ, her son. These great saints, uh, missionaries who gave up their life, they had great devotion to Mary. Mary's a help, an intercessor. 
She keeps us close to her son. If you see Mary in the true light, you see your son. Can you separate the mother from the baby? She had the baby. I don't care how old our Lord is, that's her baby. Just like you, no matter how old you are, you're your mother's baby. And you mothers out there, no matter how your big sons are and they think they're big, they're your baby. And Jesus Christ, even though he grew strong and became his public life, that was her baby. She gave him strength when he was walking up the hill to Calvary, along the streets of Jerusalem, carrying the cross. He saw his mother, gave him strength. And she wanted him to fulfill his duty. She knew that he was God and the Messiah, and his duty was to suffer and die for our sins. So she wanted him to do his duty. Oh, sure, she wept tears. Of course she cried, because you don't like to see your son suffer, but she knew it was for a good reason. She knew it was the will of God the Father, and it was good for the salvation of the world. But still she cried. That's okay. You can cry because uh, you don't like to see your loved ones suffer. So have no fears about devotion to Mary. Say the rosary. Come to our chapel uh, in uh, West Orange, which would be uh, St. Anthony of Padua Chapel, traditional Latin Mass, three Masses on Sunday. We have a phone number and a schedule. You'll see that on the graphics in a few moments. <clears throat> we hope to see you there, and uh, we have the rosary before the first two Masses. People in the church say the rosary. And, uh, and we have Novena to Our Lady before the third Mass. So we'll, we'll sign off with the blessing. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and remain forever. Amen. May God bless you and watch over you all.